um, we simply don't need the paradigm of central station power anymore. I, I am not suggesting that this path is easy. Um, you know, Japan is in a, in a tough spot. But, um, but to build more central station power in a, um, especially nuclear, in an area that's so seismically active, uh, to me, there's an opportunity here looking forward to lead the world in a new technology as opposed to follow the world in an old technology. Uh, my credentials are up there. Um, I would like to thank you, and I am prepared to take questions. Dr. Gunderson was uh, very much looking forward to receiving questions from the audience, so uh, please raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. Hi, dear Anderson, and identify yourself by stating your it name and affiliation. And I'm a freelance uh, journalist, uh, individual member of the uh, Press Club. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my question is regarding the appropriate level of the number of uh, nuclear power plants that Japan can accommodate. Considering the scale and size of our country, uh, our country is a very small country with a, a lot of uh, population. U.S. is a big country, and you have many areas where you don't have uh, much uh, population. But in Japan, uh, we have uh, four islands of Japanese archipelago, and we, end up, we ended up in having more than 50 nuclear power plants. Uh, aside from the question of whether nuclear power generation is good or bad, uh, when we introduced the nuclear power generation, I believe the number was uh, too excessive that we have more than 50. So I'd like to find uh, your uh, uh, opinion as an expert regarding the appropriate uh, level of uh, nuclear power stations, if we have to have one. Um, um, uh, we have to consider a certain geographical elements as well as the uh, sort of a uh, soft power aspect uh, by which I mean that uh, we have a country where bureaucracy is uh, rather strong but uh, we didn't have an organization to protect uh, the residents uh, against uh, the nuclear power plants and uh, we found out uh, after all that the bureaucracy was not as uh, uh, correct and uh, accurate in action as we believed it to be but anyway uh, in the face of strong bureaucracy we have. Uh, what do you think is the appropriate level of the number of nuclear power plants that Japan should have? Thank you. The, um, uh, I think the siting a nuclear power plant depends on um, three things. Um, and the first is, is having enough cooling water. Um, Japan uh, certainly has enough cooling water for the 50 nuclear reactors that it presently has. But the second two criteria are harder. The, the second one is, um, is seismicity. Um, Japan has 0.3% of the land mass of, um, of the world, but at the same time it has 10% of the world's earthquakes. So essentially, there's 30 times more earthquakes in Japan than anywhere else on the planet. So from a seismic standpoint, it's very difficult um, to build a power plant to withstand what Japan is reasonably expected to withstand over the next um, thousand years. You really need to design for the thousand-year earthquake, not the hundred-year earthquake. Um, so I, I think from a structural engineering standpoint, it's very, very difficult to build a nuclear power plant strong enough to withstand the, the Japanese thousand-year earthquake. So uh, you know the Japanese recently did a stress test on, um, on their nuclear reactors. One week before the Fukushima accident, the, the Fukushima units would have passed the stress test. So the stress test just confirms that they're built as strong as engineers like, like me uh, designed them in the first place. The stress test really doesn't show if they're capable of withstanding something much more severe than they were designed for, which is exactly what happened at Fukushima. The third piece is the population density, and of course Japan has a very high population density. Um, so there's one thing that's good, plenty of cooling water, and two things, the, the seismic issues and the population density, which really um, mean that nuclear power plants are very difficult to build here. In order to make the plant strong enough 
to withstand um, the seismic issues that are unique to Japan and the population density, what happens will be that the cost will increase to the point that other alternatives will become um, viable. So if you, I can't answer your question precisely how many, but in order to make them withstand the rigors of Japan, the cost will get to the point that other alternatives uh, will become attractive. Shimura, and also, I'm also an individual member of the press club. I have two questions. The first one, was there any communication or instruction from GE to TEPCO about the uh, defective uh, reactor, which is Mark I? Uh, I don't know the time frame, uh, like uh, 30 years after the invention, GE contacted TEPCO and saying that uh, this uh, reactor is a defective reactor, so you should uh, decommission it, or uh, uh, GE said it, uh, but uh, TEPCO did not uh, uh, listen to that? Uh, was that the case? Uh, that's the first question. The second question is a pool thermal uh, that uh, Japan is uh, pursuing. This is uh, quite different from Chernobyl or uh, uh, Three Mile Island. Uh, if a pool thermal uh, system goes uh, and if it uh, goes uh, wrong, uh, I think uh, there is going to be a lot of emission release of strontium. Uh, but uh, government and TEPCO are all reticent. They are quiet about the pool thermal system. So so uh, uh, as an expert, uh, what will be the kind of explosion if this uh, propel thermal uh, system uh, goes wrong? Uh, not only cesium, but uh, will there be many other uh, uh, radioactive uh, materials uh, released? Okay. Uh, the first question on the Mark I reactor. Um, um, I'm, I'm friends with a um, general electric engineer named Dale Breidenbaugh, and um, uh, Dale resigned from General Electric in 1976 because as a matter of honor he felt that the Mark I was not an adequate design and um, General Electric continued to build them and, and promote them. So General Electric's position has always been that um, the Mark I meets, uh, met the standards that um, were in effect at the time it was built and because of the changes they have put on the plant, those, um, those changes continue to make the design adequate even today. I don't believe that General Electric has ever admitted that um, its design was, um, was inadequate, uh, just that it, um, uh, it needed to be improved upon and the, f and the repairs that had been made over the years were, were adequate. It this is not just Japan. You know, in, in the United States, we have 23 Mark Ones, um, including a Mark One design that is even older than um, the Fukushima uh, Unit One uh, at Oyster Creek. So no one, either the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States or or, or, or NISA here um, or TEPCO or the owners. Um, have ever recognized that the Mark I design is inadequate. There have been um, engineers like me or, or, or uh, Mr. Breidenbaugh who have been for years talking about the inadequacy of the design, but the, um, um, the regulatory authorities have, um, uh, have basically said that it was built and we call it grandfathered, it was grandfathered in on your pluthermal um, question, um, the pluthermal design is, um, is novel and new and looks good on paper. Um, but the problem is that um, uh, reactor control in a pluthermal plant is, um, is even more sensitive than it is in a, um, in a uranium plant. So all these designs look good um, until they get built and then um, the operating problems begin to uh, become evident. They, your question on releases, um, a plutothermal plant will release more plutonium uh, in the event of an accident, which is um, much more hazardous than the uh, strontium and the um, cesium that was released at Fukushima. The, there's a, the MOX, MOX stands for mixed oxide fuel. Now, each of the Fukushima reactors had plutonium in them um, because as uranium-238 uh, is in a nuclear reactor longer and longer, it becomes plutonium. So 
all, all six reactors already had plutonium in the core. The, there was additional plutonium in Unit 3. There were 30 bundles of called MOX fuel, which stands for mixed oxide, meaning it contained extra plutonium. Not enough extra plutonium in Unit 3 to make the accident any different. Now, had there been uh, an inc a complete MOX core in Unit 3, um, nuclear reactor control is dramatically different with plutonium compared to uranium. But the accident at Unit 3 was no worse because of the 30 test bundles at, uh, of MOX fuel. My is Kawamura, and I'm, I'm from a TV station, a television, Asahi. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, because your presentation was quite insightful, uh, suggesting that the future path for the Japanese uh, energy policy and so forth. Now, going forward, the uh, U.S. has issued a license, a first license in uh, 34 years for constructing a new uh, power, a nuclear power plant. So, uh, considering the future of Japan, the U.S., and uh, in fact, uh, for the whole world, uh, if uh, the nuclear power generation continues, we will have to consider the disposal of the nuclear waste. Uh, we have not uh, resolved the question of uh, intermediate repository and much less uh, anything about the final deposit, uh, uh, disposal of the nuclear uh, waste. Uh, do you think that uh, the current uh, method of uh, vitrifying uh, and burying underground is uh, the uh, uh, successful way and do you believe that it's going to be successful or do you think that we live in a world where we have to think uh, something different. The, um, thank you. The, the Americans just licensed uh, something called the AP-1000. And it's interesting because it couldn't be built in Japan. The AP-1000 has a huge water tank on its roof, um, six million pounds. Um, um, I'm trying to convert that to kilograms, so I've got to take half of that. Um, so anyway, there's a huge water tank, and from a seismic standpoint, the last thing you want is a large mass on the top. Um, so the, um, the, although we've licensed it for low seismic areas like Georgia, we can't even build them in California, let alone have them built here. Um, on, your, on your broader question about um, um, what to do with the nuclear waste, um, uh, Ever since I was in college, we've always thought the solution is five years in front of us, and it never seems to get there. Um, uh, vitrification appears to work for short periods of time, but when we realize that we have to keep this material for a quarter of a million years before it's decayed away, it isn't the ultimate solution either. Um, even, and I think it's in this respect, um, waste storage in Japan is worse than um, waste storage in, in other areas where there's uh, large locations of relatively low seismic um, uh, where you might be able to store it. Um, I think what the Fukushima accident has, has forced the, um, the Japanese to realize is that the, the nuclear fuel cycle is not closed. You can't take the uranium and reprocess it and put it back in then have this never-ending loop where you don't have to worry about the nuclear waste. And um, on an island of this size with this population density and the um, seismicity here, um, it's my biggest concern. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that, and I don't really think that anyone does. Closing, I, I would like to honor the, the, the men and women, especially the men at, at Fukushima, um, Daini and, and Diachi, for the bravery. I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I would like to thank my excellent translator. <laughs> and I'm about to have another opportunity so that we can hear about the decommissioning, which is your expertise. This is a token of our appreciation.